Um, just to give you an idea, uh, I'm going to run through some of the things from 2019, some accomplishments and some, um, some of the projects that have been completed, and then um, pretty much replicate how those projects have um, changed or how they're working now based on, based on um, the conditions that we're all dealing with right now. Um, so look back at 2019, I'll just be covering a few topics related to uh, milfoil removal, water quality monitoring, and the watershed plan is the biggest component of that. Um, to begin, looking back at the milfoil management program, um, this graph shows uh, the, the amount of milfoil that was removed from a few different sites. So if you looked on the y-axis, the one up and down, it's on the far left, is the amount of milfoil removed in gallons. And then if you look uh, across the x-axis here, the left to right gives you the year. Um, the, the columns are broken down into three different colors, and those are broken down into um, different locations within the watershed. Big Squam, uh, Little Squam in the channel, and the Squam River. So as you can see, uh, the large amount of milfoil that had been removed um, has decreased to primarily just the Squam River in 2019 um, and, and very little in Big Squam, Little Squam in the channel itself following uh, the last year's season. Um, something else we're looking at as well is um, not just how much was removed, but the effort put in to remove how much milfoil. So as you can see again on the left here is the amount of milfoil removed in gallons on the y-axis. Um, across the bottom is by year, and then um, on the right side of the y-axis is crew hours, so the amount of time spent diving in hours. The green um, is reflecting the milfoil removed. So if you look at uh, the timeline here, you have the milfoil removed in the green columns and the amount of time spent in the blue columns. Without getting into details comparing you know, gallons removed versus crew hours, one thing that's very noticeable um, beginning in 2017 is there was a lot more time spent surveying for milfoil than was actually removed. So that was a big accomplishment um, in kind of the 2015-2016 where a lot of time was spent just checking sites where milfoil was removed um, and making sure it didn't come back. And the biggest change overall was in 2019 where very little milfoil was removed compared to the amount of time that was actually surveyed. Uh, moving on to water quality, um, in the winter water quality monitoring, 49 um, samples were taken among 10 sites. And that was the third year for this program. For the summer water quality monitoring, it was the 41st year, there was 171 samples taken among 15 sites. Um, the reason there's not long-term data reflected back through 2019, is I'll discuss it further uh, in the presentation, but we're actively reconstructing the water quality database. It was previously in Microsoft Access, and I found that it would crash often. It was on one computer, um, and due to the conditions with um, remote working, um, only one person could enter it on one computer. So we're working on transitioning from that Microsoft Access program to um, Google Spreadsheets. So we have 2020 being entered into that program and uh, it pretty much requires one person to sit there and export data for hours uh, to allow that to be transmitted into other programs. Um, so right now, uh, this is how we're, we are framing the water quality monitoring from last year, um, but there are no dramatic changes that should, um, should cause any major concerns at this, at this point. Um, next is the largest component, the watershed plan. So the 2019 version um, was a lot more elaborate than the original 1991 version. It actually gives um, deliverables of what we can accomplish as an organization and throughout the watershed to reach certain levels um, in the long term, broken down year by year and to decades. The guidelines were created from a steering committee, a water quality, advisory committee with technical and staff reviewers, um, also used long-term water quality monitoring data, and then a watershed, watershed survey. 
uh, that identified hot spots and documented areas where nutrients and, and sediment or erosion were having an impact in the watershed, um, as you can see in the, in the photo in the top right corner. And these guidelines that are recommended in the watershed plan meet both federal and state standards, both through uh, US EPA funding and uh, DES's requirements. Overall, uh, this watershed plan um, it has well-defined management goals. So um, decisions that uh, are driven by SLA within the watershed are supported by years of data collection, years of analysis. Um, many committees and people reviewing uh, the project to understand, is this right for the watershed as a whole? And we believe uh, moving forward that this gives good, lays good groundwork to make decisions um, in the long term. That's a short section of, of last year, um, because I know a lot of you are probably curious of how things change from then to now. Um, as Angie said, I, was, I began in January of 2019. And Rebecca did an amazing job, including pretty much handing off a completed watershed management plan. Um, so I just wanna reiterate some of the accomplishments from 2019 and how those exact um, tasks were, um, have changed to this year. So some of the ongoing projects. First off, I'll cover terrestrial invasive species, their ongoing water quality monitoring, um, how we're enacting the watershed plan through landscape management, uh, looking at lake use and contaminants. To begin, um, we, we've had some difficulties uh, with diving and milfoil removal, uh, which I'll, I'll explain in a little bit, but. Um, in response to that, we began our summer focusing on terrestrial invasive species right off the bat. Um, when the LRCC arrived in Holderness, uh, they were graciously put up at um, Cottage Place and they were in quarantine for two weeks. So they were um, in the cabins working on projects. So the goal was to be able to, be able to get them involved and trained right off the bat. Uh, that began with assigning each member uh, a, a local invasive species, uh, terrestrial invasive species. From that, uh, they created PowerPoint presentations that had certain tasks, how to identify the species, common lookalikes, removal techniques, how it got here, how it spreads. Um, and then from that, those were all compiled and all the members reviewed um, all the different material from many terrestrial invasive species in the area. Uh, the next step was to create a video um, with some of some somewhat of guidelines on a script, but um, outlining what they had spoke about uh, within the PowerPoint presentation. So, here's an example on the top right of Rachel showing uh, how to remove multifloral rose. Um, the the next box down, the blue the blue colored um, logo here is talks about programs and volunteer opportunities. So the final step was to take the knowledge they had gained becoming experts in that species and bring it into the community. So um, on Sundays, we've been doing terrestrial invasive removal days where volunteers can sign up, learn how to remove a certain species, how to identify it, and spend a couple hours with um, an LRCC member to kind of become an expert on their own to be able to bring that knowledge back to their community. Uh, these are being held a few more weekends throughout the summer, and it's uh, regularly advertised on the SLA website. Also this year, um, there's been some changes in water quality monitoring, so it's still occurring. About half of the sites are being covered by LRCC. Uh, others are being covered by uh, devoted volunteers that almost every single volunteer that's completing the other sites has, has um, done this program in the years past, so they are experts. Um, and, and the only review we had was a Zoom meeting early on in the season to go over what was in each water quality monitoring kit. Um, another thing we, I had mentioned earlier was the new online data entry. Um, so that database is, is ongoing and trying to transition to that program. Um, another step different than last year is uh, no access to the water quality lab. So uh, volunteers drop off their water quality samples on a refrigerator on the porch of the main uh, front of the SLA building. Then the AmeriCorps at another, another moment will take that sample down to uh, uh, an office downstairs, filter the sample, 
and then it gets put back in the freezer where then it gets transported to UNH uh, for future analysis. The goal is in the next couple of weeks is to have individual sampling kits for each volunteer uh, or at each site. So nobody is sharing any equipment. On one hand, that means we're not using the YSIs uh, to collect more data at each site, but it allows each site to be sampled by people that aren't coming in contact with each other and they can hold on to that equipment instead of transferring it back and forth and checking it out. Um, in the next couple of weeks, we'll be creating more of these kits um, to complete more contactless volunteer training. So we have completed one so far where uh, LRCC members were in one boat with their own kit. Volunteers were in another boat tied up or nearby with another kit and went over step by step how to sample that site. So uh, that's the goal in the next couple of weeks is to uh, get more people involved um, and have more equipment to be able to not share as the season goes. Some tasks this season um, involving the watershed plan um, include three kind of major topics at this point. Um, one of them, landscape management. We're working with um, landowners and other organizations to look at um, how shoreline can be managed uh, based on guidelines within the watershed plan to achieve long-term goals for water quality and uh, environmental consciousness. Some of that includes restoration projects and uh, gaining, um, gaining support within the watershed for people to be able to come to SLA um, with concerns and then us to be able to walk them through the process of if they have a concern that something isn't right, um, how they can be entitled to, to go through that step by step on their own to learn the process and uh, have a sense of accomplishment uh, protecting the watershed. Also with lake use, um, everybody across the state has seen an increase in enhanced lake use uh, for many different aspects from boats, kayaks, canoes, swimmers, um, seasonal properties to town beaches. That's one concern right now that we're looking at and how those the enhanced lake use is affecting um, water quality and the influence and the impact on the watershed, uh, including the environmental problems that could arise in this, like swimmer's itch or cyanobacteria blooms or impacts on um, other things like uh, eroding shoreline or um, impacting wildlife, most notably loons within Squam Lake. Another major concern uh, are, ba are ballast or wake boats. Um, we've began discussion with other stakeholders within the state following um, a year long process where a study committee was established to review the use of uh, ballast or wake boats across the state. So uh, we are moving forward with how SLA can partner with other organizations to um, take further steps to um, combat this concern and, and what steps would be best to take. Uh, and finally, major point, um, basing our goals from the watershed plan off of um, other concerns that have recently come to light, including not only um, DDT, uh, but more recently PCBs found in fish samples. Um, to do that, we're looking at um, completing stream crossing assessments, looking at where a stream will flow under a road to understand how sediments transported within the watershed um, and how municipalities or state organizations can uh, create infrastructure improvements to improve how sediments are transported and, um, and stream flow during more frequent storm events. Um, with that, we're also working with um, some stakeholders to create a plan. Um, at this point, um, plan could be anything from more sampling to remediation or more surveys. Um, that's still up in the air, but the conversation is, is has begun and is ongoing to try to find the best overall um, steps for the Squam watershed. Um, one of the major concerns uh, we've received information on recently is uh, the return of milfoil within the lake. Um, there have been some situations out of our control that have dictated how our season has gone, um, beginning with the single um, instructor to certify divers to remove milfoil uh, retired earlier this spring and nobody else in the state of New Hampshire can certify divers in milfoil or aquatic invasive removal. Um, following that, the organization that trains us 
um, to dive had some of their employees um, kind of step back based on concerns of COVID-19. Um, that has restricted us to learning about a month ago um, to snorkeling with members of SLA that have already been certified in diving and weed control, can continue to dive. Uh, so our goal is beginning Monday, um, having the SLA members, uh, new, new members this season, snorkel on sites that are known to have historic milfoil, um, other sites where people have reported they suspect milfoil, and then uh, about once or twice a week have the few members we have in SLA that can actually scuba in, remove this milfoil, um, do some removal. Our goal is to keep it at bay at this point um, and, and, and monitor where problem locations are um, and, and plan early for next year to really combat this head on beginning early on next season. Uh, due to those changes, uh, we'll hopefully be, be enhancing our Weed Watcher program. If you're familiar with the view scopes, a lot of people use to, for water quality or to look at um, aquatic invasives, those are discontinued. So uh, next Wednesday, I'll be working with an LRCC member to create homemade view scopes um, that will be shared among local communities so they can um, enhance the program throughout the watershed as well. Uh, with that, uh, I have two poll questions, if you wouldn't mind answering.